Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming back. Now, as you can tell by my voice, I've decided to join a majority of you and, and pick up the Arcadia sore throat or cough or whatever it is. And um, so if that's the reason I'm using the hand mic. So if I start to go to a coughing fit, I can throw the mic off to the side or call on my trusty assistant here to run up and uh, come and help me. Now, previously, how many, first of all, how many in the audience were at my first presentation? A few, okay. Just a quick background. I've done one presentation already which indicated when we emigrated from the UK out to Melbourne, that's John and I, my charming husband down there, he normally says I'm the charming wife, he's gone through a number of presentations already. We met, we married, we emigrated to Melbourne, he got disillusioned with his work, decided he wanted something exciting and off we headed into Papua New Guinea. Didn't know where it was, didn't know what we were up to. So my first presentation took you through the um, this, this sort of north coast of Papua New Guinea in the Madang district where we were first based. Then we were transferred from the Madang district up into the southern highlands. And this map, hopefully, will show you the Saidor up to Tari. Now Saidor was our second posting and then we were sort of advised we were transferring. We flew into Goroka, we'd packed up all our gear, for those who remember, I packed them up, weighed it all, got it in a plane, got it from side or up to Garoka, then we got told we were moving to Tarry in the Southern Highlands. So off we went up into those Highland areas. Fabulous trip, but still didn't know what it was going to be like. Now we'd come from two coastal postings, which were quite small, about 10 expatriates on one, and on the other side of one there was only three expatriate families. But when we moved up into the Southern Highlands, these, this just gives you an indication of the airstrip in Tarry, which was quite large. There was about 100 expatriates living there, missionaries, and there was doctors and a hospital and a few other things. And we got choices of government houses, and there was three different styles. Um, I've just pointed them out on the lower slide there. And they were basically the same. But the first one we were given up on the left, they said, oh, we've got this bigger house if you want it. And we said, oh, yes, please. So we went in, and as John, with his long white socks, walked across the floor, all these little black things were jumping up his socks and we realized it was fleas. That's why nobody was living in it. So we cleaned up the house, got ourselves set up, put the kerosene and the sawdust on the floor, brushed it in, and we made ourselves our, our very comfortable home. Now they had big louver windows. We had no electricity. We, uh, the power was only on for a couple of hours in the morning and two or three hours in the evening. It was run by a diesel generator down in the main center. When we didn't have power, we ended up putting up the kerosene lamps. But most of our fridges and freezers were kerosene. Our stoves were aga burners, if anyone knows what an aga burner stove is. We used those in the colder climates up in the highlands, which was really great. And the, the furniture was exactly the same as we'd had on the coast. So all my handcraft work at making the cushion covers for my chairs and my curtains fitted wherever we ended up moving to. So we just carted those around with us. The house in the lower picture was our second house when we went back to Tarry after we'd been over in another posting, but I'll cover that in a minute. Again, on the coast, I remember telling you that uh, our groceries came by ship every three months. There was no stores, no shops, no transport, except by, by boat. So the, the crew would bring in our, uh, our groceries on a three-monthly basis. Now, when we moved up to the Highlands, we had to get together with the other expatriate women put our shopping lists together, and then we would send for a charter plane to bring in the bulk groceries. And this was the charter plane arriving in Tarry with all our shopping. Now, for those that were at the first presentation, I posed a cryptic clue about communication challenge. Do you remember that slide going up in our very first presentation where we gave you a, a few, few stories? Can anyone guess what the reason for that slide was? Now, it's a communication challenge with the Papua New Guineans. When you are, you've got to be very explicit when you're talking to Papua New Guineans. And when we said to our houseboy, can you go and make the bed? Now, you and I, we would think about getting the sheets and the blankets or whatever, and we would make the bed. But they would come to us and say, have you got the hammer and nails and wood and I can go off and make you a bed? So they, they wanted the actual things. So you've got to be very careful. Another challenge is the Highlands market. We're slightly different to the coastal markets. 
different foods, different vegetables. I learned how to, to get involved with all sorts of new cooking, cooking things and baking things. And they had live chickens that you could go and buy. Communication issue, said to the houseboy, can you go down to the market, get me a chicken, pluck it and put it in the fridge. Now what have I forgotten to say? To kill it first. So what happened? The chicken, you, we came home and you open up the fridge door and out popped this very naked, cold chicken. So again, you've got to be very, very careful. But you get to live with these sorts of things. Now remember, we were only 21 years old, so the whole, the whole adventure didn't really bother us at all. We were just quite happy to go along with whatever. A bit like being on a cruise ship, really. Yeah, just go along with whatever's going to happen. So when John needed to go on patrol, or if we had any guests coming in, there was agricultural officers, there was um, doctors, business, government people, anyone came into the outstation, there was no hotels or spare accommodation, so they would stay with us. So we always had to make sure our pantry was full of foodstuffs to be able to cater for any unexpected guests. And you still didn't know how long they were going to stay. They could be there one night, or they could be there a week. The... Um, the types of unexpected visitors could be a visiting Spanish film crew or perhaps a Japanese crew making a documentary. They'd just arrive and then John would have to take them off to wherever it was they wanted to get to to make their films or be involved. We didn't speak Spanish or Japanese, but we got on really well in the end, especially my mother. My mother enjoyed being with the Japanese. John mentioned it the other day. They would sit down with their Johnny Walker well, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in my fun first presentation, but my mother used to sit with them because she, she enjoyed a Johnny Walker as well. And as the bottle went round, mum would have a little tipple as it kept going. Now, for those that weren't at the first one, the reason my mother is there. She, uh, the first posting we had was a tropical paradise. Loved it. She's in London. She's my mum. I'm the only girl of seven. I've got six big brothers. My father had died just a couple of years before. We emigrate, leave her on her own, and I write back to mum from Papua New Guinea to say, I'm living in a tropical paradise, mum. It's absolutely beautiful. Swaying palm trees, golden sea, golden reef, beautiful blue seas, coral, everything. Walk out, pick up the shells. If you ever want to join us, feel free. And she was on the next ship out. And as jo she stayed with us for 25 years. And I mean stayed with us. So she came from London to Sydney, to Papua New Guinea. And she never learnt the language, so she had quite a few communication challenges. But she joined us, and she joined in with everything that we were doing. This is her vegetable garden. She loved gardening, so she was able to set up a, a proper huge vegetable garden. And she, we would help, she would help me cook for the unexpected guests, governor generals, British High Commissioner, whoever turned up, we, we just looked after them. But she spent three months catering for an oil company that was based in Como. Now, you saw that, that story that John was telling you about the LP gas and all of those areas. Well, the, back in the early years, it was search, uh, oil search came in. And there was 12 young guys came to stay in an empty old house next to us. And we catered for them for three months. So, but because my mum had run a guest house in Edinburgh, she was quite happy to, to do all of this. Now, she was very good at making stews, and she was teaching me how to do all this cooking, but we didn't have any meat. We had no shops nearby us, so what did we have to do? We had to kill our own beast. That's a, that's a lovely diagram. If you need one of those, if you haven't gone to the butcher and said, give me a rump or a topside or whatever, after the beast had hung and it got chopped up into manageable pieces, then we took them back to our houses, and all the women would get together get our plastic bins and plastic bags out, and we divvy up the, the um, meat between us. So you might get the top side one month, and somebody else would get the rump, and then somebody else would get the fillet, and we'd share it out. And it was a great social event, because we'd sit around and have a couple of beers and share all this food out, and it would go into our freezers to last us for the next couple of months. Now, this is the Hooli Wigmen that were in the, the uh, photograph that John showed the other day. These were our neighbours. So they were walking around like that all the time and they were celebrating and I'd have them around the house. You know, we'd, we'd get on really, really well. Hogger Go is the clan leader. So uh, when we did the Can We Help programme, I don't know if you saw the TV 
where I was, I was shaking hands with Hogger Gold. We were saying farewell at the airport, and I leant forward and gave him a little, pretending to give him a little kiss. Prior to that, John was getting in and out of the NBC truck with a cameraman. Hogger Gold and I had to get in the back of the truck, and it hadn't occurred to me what I was doing, but I think John mentioned it yesterday, the, or the day before, the ash grass, the grass that comes down the back for the, for the local people. I was helping Hogger Gold get in, into the truck, and I put my hand down, and I was pushing him up into the back of the truck. I nearly came his eighth wife. I got terribly close to what I shouldn't have been doing. But I was helping him. He was 80 years old in 2007. And like I said the other day, I had to find some work. Now, on the inside or in, in Bogia, I basically did admin work in the office, banking, radio skates. Now, when we were in Atari and Como, I actually learned how to read the weather. Now, it wasn't really important for us to know what the weather was like. It was either hot or wet, wet and hot, exactly what you're going to experience in the next couple of days, wet and hot, hot and wet. So I had, but I had to read it and pass the information through to Port Mosby so they could retain those records for future reference. So I learned how to work out what the cloud formations were, how far to the horizon, when it was going to rain. So I'd have to go out and check the rain gauge. And often I'd go out and it would be a slightly different colour to what I was used to. And I wasn't quite sure if it was the local village dog had come past and filled up my water gauge. So I would ring through that it had been raining and they're all going, that's amazing, there was no rain clouds around. But then I worked in the uh, government, uh, local government offices and enjoyed all the variety of work that I was doing. Quick stop. Ugh. Okay, now some of the other things that we got up to to pass the time away. There, there was a little bit of a golf course that the patrol officers made out of a bit of a hill. We had movies, and the old 16 mil movies would come in their boxes, and we'd roll them through, and we had like a little tennis club. We got a little bit up market and built a little tennis club thing. And we'd show these movies, and often whoever had the movies before put them in the wrong boxes. So we'd have reel three would be in box one, and reel two would be in box two, and you know, you'd be mixed up, so you never knew what you were going to watch. So you always got the ending of a murder mystery at the beginning. So that was quite a, an amusing way to pass the time away. I got into a lot of uh, handcrafts, and this is me making macrame out of bush material made string. It's from the, the, the bark, and then you, you split it off, and then you would rub it on your thigh to make it into the string, and then you could use it for your macrame or for billums and things like that. But we, uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it, and the color, the bluey color was the uh, carbon paper that were used in the offices, and you put it into the water and you could colour the water blue. A lot of the old guys would use the black, car black carbon paper, put, the put it in water and then rub it on the tops of their heads if they didn't have any hair to make it go black. Quite fascinating fashion statement there. Now, one of the handcrafts that John got into, and I'm sorry about the image, it's not very good, it was nails. You know the, the string pictures we used to do back in the 70s, put all the nails in and do all the the string up. Well, John made a um, string picture of a hooli wig and a kundu drum. Now that's a door, an actual door he took out on patrol. I think he said he was off on patrol once for six months every week, Monday to Friday, staying you know, a few miles from the outstation. He would take the door out there and the nails and all the string and he would sit, sit and work on that over, over night times because he had nothing else to do and he'd be under the Coleman lamp and it made it back to the tennis center. This is a, an image of the patrol officer's house at Pajaka, that place that he was going to every week. And he would end up uh, staying in that, at the back of it, just in the back, there's a concrete piece sticking out. That's actually a fireplace. And inside the, inside the house was this beautiful, ornate fireplace that patrol officers didn't have much to do, so they started designing a piece of interior design work inside the grass huts. And he had this magic, magic fireplace. I, st I did actually go on patrol with him out to this one. And it was really, really lovely to see all the wildlife and birds and everything around. Just in the morning, just, there's no lights, no nothing. It's pitch black. And we had actually gone out there to uh, establish a netball court, believe it or not, for the community centre. 
So we had the opening of the netball court, and this was the entertainment with these old dancers who don't often uh, come out in that area, and they cer certainly not of it, they're not there nowadays. But after a, a period of time in Tarry, um, that Tarry outstation had about 100 expatriates there, and every month we would do things like go off to the, the local uh, father, Catholic church, and he would get out the altar wine, um, and you know the, nurse, the nuns would be teaching us the jitterbug dancing. So it was a monthly activity that we got up to, and it was, it was a lot of people, so it was really, really in interesting for us. But after a period of time, John got uh, posted away, and this was where we ended up. This is Como, and it's another small place. Again, it was this little airstrip. John showed you the huge, big airstrip that's been built for, those, uh, for the LNG plant. Now, that arrow that's there, that was our house. We were the only expatriates, the only white people in amongst. And the only way in and only way out was by plane. There's mountains on either side of us. And that's the Como patrol post. And we, John was the officer in charge. And that's where he went off down to the Basavi region, those, those areas that he patrolled in. And uh, the first, that was the first patrol reports that he did back in 1973. The first patrol had been in there in uh, 1963, I think. So the people were, weren't used to having us around, but they soon, they soon got around. I was glad I had my mum with me then, but I, I also, the house, again, was another uh, government-style house, a new one, and John had built in underneath with bush materials so that he could, um, we could store things. You know, like, like a huge pantry, basically, because we were totally on our own there. We had to fly everything in. So that was our storeroom. And uh, it was the same furniture again, same type of house, the, the four-inch four uh, pole so that it would sway if there was an earthquake. And the water, um, somebody asked me the other day, the hot water system down on the coast, we had rainwater tanks on the, on the houses, and we just pumped the water up into the header tank, and the water would heat up with the sun, so that was perfectly hot enough. However, up in the highlands, it got quite cold. So the ingenious way we heated our water in this little shed is a 44-gallon drum full of water over the top of an open fire. The houseboy in the morning would get up, light the fire, heat up the water, yell out to us that the water was hot enough for a shower. We'd race into our bathroom, and he would start pumping it up into the header tank, so it would then come through into the shower room nice and hot. And that was the way we did our washing as well. And uh, of course, when we were in Como, I was waiting the, the birth of our first son. Now, most expatriate women would head back to Australia and they'd stay down there for maybe three months before, during and after the birth. I decided I had my mum with me and I was perfectly okay. Nothing much was happening, except I didn't know when the baby was due. I had, no idea, I had no idea, so they kept trying to induce me, and it, it didn't work. So eventually, when Craig decided he was going to come, he was born in the Mendy Hospital, and we, so we went into the main town centre, and uh, Craig was born, and that's, that's, we had like a, little, it's like a little motel room. The hospital was quite new, but it just had like the equivalent of a motel room where we would stay, or a hotel room type thing. And he was born, and everything was fine. Now, the doctor down here, this gentleman... He's French-Canadian, volunteer services overseas. Now, they normally travel overseas to do some, uh, you know, special works. Well, he was studying tropical diseases. He had never delivered a baby in his life before, and uh, he, was, he was delivering the baby. And the sister, she was brand new, uh, based in Mendy Hospital. In fact, when, we, when I was having the blood pressure taken, she had the blood pressure pump around the wrong way, so it was pumping up. It was pumping up instead of, you know instead of taking the measurement. But when I took my clothes, the little case of clothes in for Craig, for the baby, the local nurses took him away and gave him his bath. And when they brought him back, he was, he was like the little Michelin X man. They put everything on him. And in those days, it was toweling nappies. We didn't have disposable nappies because we didn't have those then. But I'd taken nappies and... Um, little nighty things and blanket, all, everything. They put it all on. So he came back as instead of a six-pound baby, he was like a 26-pound baby. He was really big. Now, when we moved back to Como, where we were on our own, the visiting um, sister would come in to do the, the clinic for the local women. And it was a little medical center. 
and this hook on the left hand side, that is the weighing scale to weigh our children. We would put our babies in our billums, they're string bags that are made up in Papua New Guinea, put the babies in there, or the pigs, because they were also very valuable, hang this on the hook, and the scale would sort of move like that. And they'd say, oh yes, he's put on weight, you're right, he's put on weight, you're okay. And that was the way I found out that Craig was okay. He was putting on however many ounces a, a month, and uh, so you didn't worry about it. And all the other women would turn up to have their babies checked and their pigs checked, you know, and they're all in the billums. And this, is a, this just shows you a billum. That's what they did. They put the babies in the billums. They're very popular. Uh, you may see some in your very short visit, uh, but they are, they're a very, very special uh, item that the women make. And when the women make them, they, they will teach you how to do it. We, we had a lesson once in PNG. But they're a cultural icon, and they're very significant, very social and cultural piece for any of the women to have. And they write songs about them, and it's, it's poems, and you know, they, they use it for all sorts of things. It's a token of love. If they give you a billum, you know, you, you, you get something back in return, and you just keep do it, filling the billum up with things. It's, it's really quite remarkable. And any, anyone that buys a billum in Papua New Guinea, the money is going back to the women in the village, because they are the only ones that know how to make them. And they also carry firewood in them, so you get big ones, and they stretch. I've got one down there I bought in Port Mosby some years ago, and it stretches. I've got everything in there, just about my case packed is in there, I suppose, ready to get off. Now, another communication challenge. Here's my mother in her garden. In the UK, she would have a rockery. She'd build a rockery. Now, when she got here, she said to the garden boys, now, she doesn't speak pigeon English, but she got the garden boys to come around and said, going to make this lovely garden. Uh, no rocks, can't find any rocks, but bring me all those dead trees. Bring me all these dead trees over here and we'll do stuff. And then the garden boys would come to John and go, oh, that lady, she's Lapoon. She's a bit crazy. They call us Lapoon Mama, old, old lady. Lapoon meaning old. Um, she's gone crazy. Those trees won't grow, they're dead. But she's asking us to bring them over for the garden. And what my mum was doing was making a woodery. She was building up the earth and soil all around the dead trees, but making it like a rockery, planting plants in between. But she just carried on. She just kept saying, oh, bring me, bring me the dead trees. They'll be all right. And it did turn in to a beautiful garden. On, I can't remember if it was this cruise or the Queen Elizabeth last year, there was a Japanese guest, there was a, a guest speaker talking about Japanese gardening. And he mentioned that it was, it was quite important for the Japanese. They would make gardens out of dead trees. It was very significant. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's my mother, Wabi Sabi, a Wabi Sabi garden. She was doing a Japanese garden back in the day. So I was really pleased to think, well, it wasn't just a rockery. It was a proper Japanese garden she was building. Now, some of the other uh, exciting things. John, in his wisdom, go off on patrol its independence is coming up and he decides to instill some ex excitement and fun and he has a competition and he tells the locals to go out and catch the largest snake and they would win five kina or whatever it was. He went off on patrol and left me. So what happens? Everyone comes to the door with their snakes, knock on the door, excuse me missus, I've got a snake. So I'd have to measure the snake, write the name and the measurement down in the, the book and I'd say, okay, when patrol officer comes back, he'll tell you which one's the longest one. Okay, and they'd walk away and throw the snake in the garden. They'd just disappear then. They'd had it measured. They didn't need to take it back. So I had a rather, rather large garden of snakes. And on the last day, just before John came home, thank goodness, this guy turned up. Now, the metal patrol boxes, are, you know, he carried this little one, the big snake, in this little metal box for days, so it was quite stunned by the time it arrived with us. And as it un uncoiled itself and he stretched it out, it turned out to be a 14 and a half foot snake, so that one won the competition. But the ladies that saw this snake coming in, the local ladies, got really excited and they hung around because they wanted to eat the snake and they put hot rocks down inside the snake so that it will cook from inside. It was like you know, slow cooking put the hot rocks in, cook it, wrap it up, put it in the ground, do their moo moo under the ground cooking. And then because the women didn't have many teeth, they didn't have a lot of chewing. It was just, it was, I think it tastes like chicken, doesn't it? Snake, tastes like chicken. 
Right, now, also what happened when we were in Como with Independence Day, we're the only uh, expatriates at the uh, lowering of the flag. I think John showed you the Australian flag coming down and the Papua New Guinea flag going up. And that's me and just be beside the flag and amongst all the, the people. So we were the only, peop only white people there with 75,000 locals. And uh, a lot of people say, how, how did you manage that? How can you, you know, live there? It was just John and I, my mum and our baby. No problems. It was all during the 1970s. And we just learned to, to live with it. And that's the reason we're sort of doing what we're doing. We're trying to let people know what else happens in Papua New Guinea. And did happen for us while we're there. And we have made lots of friends even to this day. And then the house girl that we had in the Highlands, this is our little son. She's lo she was looking after him. She would take him everywhere with her. So he would go off into the jungle all on his little lonesome. You know, we'd go off looking, looking for wildlife or birds or whatever. And we'd go off to waterfalls, and then the dog, as John said the other day, would unearth pigs and chase the pigs out. Our house girl would grab Craig and just run out of the, the jungle, and we'd be all chasing out to try and get away from the wild pigs. Now, after, after independence, we, uh, we ended up moving back to Tari, and we stayed in Tari for another 18 months or so. And then when we were finally leaving, we uh, had a moo moo. And they put this on for us. This is our Buffy-style farewell. And if you can see the guy in the top left-hand photograph with a crocheted jumper on, the black, red, and gold, they're the things that my mum used to do. She'd sit in crochet hats, beanies, jumpers, and everything to keep herself busy. And we would do the census reporting. We'd do any job that was going that we could do at home. My mum and I would sit down and do it. And this was our farewell. And that's little Craig having his chicken that was cooked in the ground and the, the guy's saying farewell to us. Now the other day I think I think we covered briefly about the, the airplane challenges didn't I, about having to hold the seat of the pilot when it fell back did I cover that the other day? Yeah and there's a few others where you know, mum and I would get in and we'd find there'd be pigs up the back of the plane or the, the middle seat was taken up with kerosene or whatever they were carrying. Everything was carried on the planes. Some of it were quite dangerous. I remember John um, had a story, I don't think he's told the one, where he went up into the, the sky in Tarry and he, as he was flying through the clouds, it was really rough, really busy. And at the back, there was a generator, but they hadn't emptied the fuel out of the generator. And the smell within the plane was, it was only a small plane. As he got through the cloud, they straightened off and they said, oh, that's good, we're up here, that we've got past that. And the, both of them, the pilot and John, were about to light up a cigarette. And of course, they realized that there was all the fuel in the back and they said, no, 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 don't do that. Let's get, let's get this down into Mendy, this plane. But uh, no, the stories are endless and we were not scared at all. So it doesn't worry us what kind of planes we get in and out of. And that was us leaving Papua New Guinea. He was just sitting there with Craig on our knees. When we revisited in uh, 2007, this was just a, a quick, quick photograph to show you as us going back then and meeting all those people that we had been friends with back in the 70s. And I think it's, I hope you all, you know, the people that saw John's presentation the other day saw the Can We Help program, and that was when they took us back. Now, when we, when we left Papua New Guinea, John's parents, were down in Adelaide. They'd emigrated from the UK as well. And of course, my mum was with me. So we had previously bought a house in Adelaide. So we thought, oh, well, we better, we better head back to Adelaide. We had a little boy. We'll go back and we'll end up in Adelaide. So this was just a few of our artifacts that we had on our wall in our house in Adelaide. But unfortunately, Adelaide really wasn't for us. You know, you move from a place like Papua New Guinea, where you've been for 10 years and you're out in the jungle and you, you're so adventurous and you're just doing things. And when you arrive back in suburbia and you're trying to get out and about and do things and people say, no, I can't do that tonight, I'm washing my hair. No, I can't do that tonight, I'm going shopping. Or no, you know, and it was so staid and typical, typical suburban life. I'm not putting that down, but I'm just saying it wasn't for us. So we packed up our house, so, sold the house, packed it up. By this time, we'd had a second son, Scott, he was born in Adelaide, packed everything up, got in our car and drove to Darwin. And uh, we got into Darwin and this 
the house on the bottom right is our Darwin house, very similar to Papua New Guinea. The one on the left is our Adelaide house, to show you the type of styles we've gone through. And of course, the top one is our Papua New Guinea house. So we, we sort of were longing to get back to the lifestyle that we'd had, and we did. We spent 10 years in the Northern Territory. And because of our involvement with the Papua New Guineans, it was obviously sort of for us to get ourselves involved with the indigenous people in the Northern Territory. So this just takes you on to another little bit of a story of what we did when we left Papua New Guinea. I've put this up because in Australia it's very strong. You have to recognize indigenous Australians who may have passed away, whose names may be used in any presentation. You've got to make them aware in case we've got an indigenous person in the audience. So that's why that slide is up. So on our way into Darwin, take the boys to visit Kakadu National Park, Norlangi, Aboriginal blue paintings. I don't know if any of you have been to Kakadu. Some of you have. I can see some heads nodding. It must be Aussies. Are you Aussie, Aussie, Aussie? And um, we ended up doing our trip around the Northern Territory into Kakadu, getting to know a bit more about the Aboriginal life, getting to meet some of the local people, the ladies at Barunga Cultural Festival. And there's a fa you know, it's fantastic up in the Territory. If you ever go back to Australia, you should try and get a trip up there. So what my job was, I took a job on with the most prestigious um, Aboriginal organisation. They've got one in the north of Northern Territory and one in the central Australia. It's called the Northern Land Council. So I was in charge of all of these traditional Aboriginal owners of the land in the Northern Territory. And it was my job to go to all of their outstations and we would be talking about land rights. We'd be talking about what they wanted on their land, what they, the types of jobs they were looking for, and what the lifestyles were going to be like. And it was a fabulous, fabulous job. And I just went everywhere, including Parliament House, Press Club, down at Canberra, around Australia. My boss and I went everywhere. This is one of my bosses. He's the direct, he was the director of the organization. And the little baby that I'm holding is his daughter, and he decided to name his daughter Morag, which was lovely. When I went to the hospital to meet it, the little baby, the nurse said to me, oh, this baby's gorgeous, and she's got a fabulous pa Aboriginal name. And I thought, oh, what name? It? Now, she did have an Aboriginal name, but she was talking about Morag, and I said, well, it's a very Scottish Aboriginal name. So I told her the, the whole story. So we don't, unfortunately, we don't know where Morag is to this day, but one day we'll track her down. Uh, there are two other bosses. I seem to be <laughs> very close to all my bosses. And uh, they, they looked after a lot of the uh, international events that happened for the Aboriginal people. And it's, it's really hard to explain, unless you're from Australia, about the land rights for the country. But it meant a lot when they weren't getting votes in the early years. And then as time went on, the government introduced the act that allowed them to consider the land rights for their land. And now it's, it's right throughout Australia. My other boss, Gulleroy, um, he got an AM, an Order of Australia, for the work he'd done for the communities and for land rights and the future of Aboriginal involvement. Now, he decided that he didn't want to go to Government House to receive his, his award, um, which you would normally get pinned on your lapel of your jacket. He wanted the administrator and the government to fly out to his homeland. And the administrator said to me, where am I going to pin his medal? And I said, on his dilly bag. So that's, that's, his, little, that's his dilly bag there. And there's his, his AM medal is pinned on here. And... If any of you see the Aboriginal dance group that came on board the other night, they were really, really excited. We walked up to them and we spoke to them in their Aboriginal language because two of the guys were from Yirrkala and that's where these are taken. This is in Yirrkala itself. So they knew they were like brothers to some of the people that we were talking about. So they were really, really excited. Now, to be part of the Aboriginal community... Normally, it's the sisters that will bestow Aboriginal names to the family members. And because I got on so well with all of the families, and we've been living in and out Darwin, in Nolanboy, around the place, um, Gulleroy's sister gave our two boys Aboriginal names, and Burkarupa and Luit Boy. And that's you know, really, really deep meaning for the boys, because they were growing up in the Northern Territory. But they also grew up as part of a ceremony with the Aboriginals. That's John's dad, by the way, on the left. 
he flew in once and we were going out to do this ceremony, which was a crocodile ceremony. Baru is the totem of the uh, Yurkala people. And they had found this, a, a crocodile had been shot and it was in the, the, Queen, in the um, Northern Territory Museum. And they decided to bring it back and give it back to the local community. It was an extremely emotional ceremony because that's like bringing back one of your dead uh, for them. So the boys were out at this ceremony. They got painted up with white clay, which looks rather weird, white clay on white bodies. And uh, they took part in the return of this huge crocodile. And the, I think, I can't see it very well, but the boys are sitting up here with the girls. There's the boys in there. There's the boys in here. That's John's father. And it was quite an emotive ceremony. And getting to see those Aboriginal guys the other night talking about the didgeridoo from Yirrkala. And uh, we've, we've got one of those didgeridoos and the clapsticks at home. So we're quite involved with the Indigenous community in the Northern Territory. Even although we live in Queensland, we've sort of kept our connections there. But one of the slides we put up early on um, you know, when we did our very first presentation, we went through all our backgrounds and we were talking about who would have thought, who would have thought we would have done all what we've done. And in fact, who would have thought we'd be on a cruise ship talking about our life in Papua New Guinea. But who would have thought that our boys, those two boys that you were dressed up with the white clay, that Scott is the youngest one born in Adelaide. He's a paleontologist, but he was also made Young Australian of the Year in 2002. Currently on the radio and in the news, they've found some recent dinosaur trackways, recent dinosaur bones, and he gets very much involved with the Australian Age of Dinosaurs and with Swinburne University and Queensland Museum and the whole lot of them, because he's, he's being sort of followed as one of the prominent and pre preeminent paleontologists in Queensland. Do you know, we were on the Aurora last year on holiday, and we went back to our cabin and switched the TV on, and I turned around and I thought my son was there. He was on television, it was a documentary. He was doing a documentary, uh, Walking with Dinosaurs. And I thought, I've got my son in the cabin with me. How did he get there? <laughs> now, our other son, Craig, the one that was born in Papua New Guinea, very proud Papua New Guinean, he plays professional golf in America. And he, has, he actually sometimes puts the Papua New Guinea flag up. He's based in Arizona, so he has the American flag. But recently, he was in Australia playing in the New South Wales Open and things. That's about the only time we ever get to see him. But he's, uh, he's a multi-professional golfer around the place. Plus, he does a trick shot show. If you ever look up Sabre Golf Training or whatever it is, because I don't even know if it's the right name. But <laughs> he, uh, he plays all over the world. And he's thoroughly enjoying himself. Not making a million dollars out of it. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't need to be doing anything. We'd be retired somewhere else. Now, um, tartans. You've seen, did anyone see John wearing his tartans the other day? The, the Papua New Guinea one on the left, he had these trues on, and the yellow one is, is the Papua New Guinea tartan as well. well these were designed for um, the Papua New Guinea pipes and drums to wear, hopefully. It's made in Scotland, in Dalglishes, in Selkirk, and hopefully it'll be worn by the Papua New Guinea pipes and drums one day when we get them to the Edinburgh tattoo, which we're working on. We've been trying to get them back there for a while. So our Scottish influences and Scottish background has had a lot to do with our Papua New Guinea, Northern Territory, moved to Queensland, got involved with Scottish Association, setting up, dancing, schools and whatnot. Left hand photograph, any of you have heard of Yotha Yindi? Yeah, no, all asleep out there I think. Yotha Yindi, that's the lead singer who's passed away now, but that's the lead singer on the left hand side, who's a good friend of ours. And we're all wearing our different tartans in our Scottish dancing. Reason I've put that photograph up, is because when we got back to Queensland, we introduced, we're, we're fundraisers with the not-for-profit sector, so we help charities raise funds for scholarships, basically, and you know, lots of foundations and trusts. So we used our Scottish influences and Scottish background to put on a Grand Highland charity ball in Brisbane for the Endeavour Foundation. And we always wanted to bring all of our connections together and we decided to have the didgeridoo playing with the bagpipes. Now, it has been done before in Adelaide, but we wanted to do it at our ball in Brisbane. And I'm hoping that this is going to work.
that's uh, William Barton. He's a virtuoso didgeridoo player. He normally plays with the Berlin Symphony Orchestra, and he flew in specifically for that Highland Ball in Brisbane, which raised a lot of money. We had over 1,200 people at the convention centre with haggis tasting and malt whiskey tasting at the back, of course, which was, went down really well. Now, I'd just like to say thank you. We, we thought we might have been making another presentation, but we got told today that tomorrow it won't happen because you're doing drills and, and uh, getting other things happening, of course. Now, I'd just like to thank the production team and the entertainment office and my musicians and all of that sort of thing for having us on the stage, like everyone else does. We don't have CDs or DVDs for sale, but John has got a little bit of information to share with you, so I will pass over to him. And thank you very much for coming along. I hope my voice wasn't a total pain. I didn't have to break up and give it to my sidekick here, but I will now because it's over to John. Thank you.